this situation. He took a pinch in the back. He got beaten for crying out loud. Heart attack. We used heart attack. Please. Managers on a major league baseball team don't make decisions. They don't know that. Credibility in this situation is worse than losing your job. Was it over with the Germans bomb pro the castration of the major league baseball managers. We know it. Ask me about my win. Seems like it's been a little while. I've officially activated myself from the injured list after being out with a couple of weeks because of a bad back. But let's be serious. Nobody freaking noticed. Nope. Nobody knows that I haven't been out here flapping my yap mouth talking sports. But what has been going on is if you watch kind of a transition in a National League and Major League Baseball of three expected playoff teams and three teams that I don't care how great of a baseball fan you are. I don't care how knowledgeable of a baseball fan you are. I don't care how much you claim to know about baseball. You weren't ready for these three teams. And let's be serious. They're for real right now. You cannot look at the rosters of the Cincinnati Reds, the Miami Marlins, and the Arizona Diamondbacks and not expect them to be playoff type of baseball teams right now. And as we get into the spot of the baseball season where the good teams get better because the, the good teams are going to get better players, right? Basically scraping uh, crap off the rosters of the teams that things aren't going so well for. There's the other element of it, of the teams that had high expectations and were expected to be legitimate World Series contenders and what it is that they should do. And obviously the Reds, the Marlins, and the Diamondbacks' success in the 2023 season has come at the expense of the Cardinals, the Mets, and the Padres. And I think it is worth it to talk a little bit about the three proceeding teams or preceding teams because are, are they in spots where they should just simply give up on a given season? Now, nobody's going to say that. Uh, officially behind a microphone and say, hey, we're quitting. But let's be real again. The writers, baseball writers, the national media, has put so much emphasis on two things that you could be as a Major League Baseball team. I don't necessarily subscribe to it, but teams basically follow the tune of the media when they say you have to either be a buyer or a seller. And there's so much marketing that's been put behind it there's been so much branding of the buyer and the seller. And you've heard me over the course of the years of doing this show talk about how much I hate those two terms because I think each individual squad, whether it's a baseball team, football team, basketball team, should operate at, at its own peril and do what it feels is best for its team and not get players that may not necessarily help them just because they happen to be doing well and not give up valuable players that they see being pieces for them down the road just because things aren't going too well. But you look at the Cardinals who are over 10 games over 500. You know, they went in between that 13 and 15 under phase, which is very uncardinal like. You've heard me talk about the, uh, the mantra of what the St. Louis Cardinals have meant going back to the days of Branch Rickey, the Cardinals way. And the couple examples, and you have to, you want to dig through the archives of the PBS, you'll hear me talk about uh, uncardinal like things that have happened over the course of the season, not just wins and losses, but things that you don't expect coming out of a well run St. Louis Cardinals organization. Then you got the Mets, the highest payroll in baseball, the richest owner in the history of sports, and things just aren't working out well. Are they snake bitten by injuries? Eh, not really. I mean, they haven't had any more major injuries than anybody else. They have pretty much the core of their team in place. Their biggest injury was the loss of their closer, Edwin Diaz, which you know has impacted them as they um, have had a hard time in the middle or late part of games. Their pitching has been awful. And you look at the Arizona Diamondbacks, who rise has come at the expense of the San Diego Padres and I'll admit I mean I don't look very good when I said I felt the Padres for the first time in the history of their franchise which dates back to 1969 we're going to win their first World Series this season there's a lot that's got to go well over the course of the next 
half of the season for the Mets, the Padres, the Cardinals, in any order for them to be a legitimate contender for a postseason spot. And the Reds, the Marlins, the Diamondbacks, they're, they're not going anywhere. And you look at the Reds, and if, if you're looking for a team to root for, if you're, if you're a fan of a, of a team that's doing bad this year and you want somebody to kind of get behind and root and kind of be excited about, the Cincinnati Reds, they've really come of age. And obviously, a lot of it has to do with Ellie De La Cruz. You know, hits for the cycle the other day. He's hitting 361. He's hitting home runs. He's stealing bases. He really has become one of the more fun players in all of Major League Baseball. And he's he's a Cincinnati Red. And you look at the the play of some of the other young players that have been up there, whether it's Matt McLean, Nick Senzel. Uh, you know, really a, a team that offensively, you know, Spencer Steer. Is, has done a very good job playing, you know, the corner infield for them. Joey Votto has come back, and yeah, he he's hitting like the Joey Votto of old, which was a couple of years ago when Votto was good. He had a bad 2022 season. Uh, you know, a veteran presence in that in that lineup, I think, will do a lot for the Reds going forward. And I, I'm sure it's probably been brought up, but their pitching is a little on the weak side, and if they're looking to basically maximize everything that they've done to this point and perform well later on in the season. I think they're going to need a front-line type of starting pitcher. Hunter Green can be that dude, but he's injured right now. And, it, you know, you think about it, is he going to be the ace? Is he ready to be the number one right now? If the Reds were playing in a playoff game, he would be their number one starter. I, I get it. You know, Brandon Williamson's a guy that they got up here pitching at the major league level. I don't know how ready he is. But I think it would be a great move if they were to swing a deal with the Chicago Cubs for Marcus Stroman. Marcus Stroman is having a Cy Young type of season. The Cubs, they're saying, hey, they're not going to quit yet. And when it comes to Stroman, the interesting thing's going to be he's got an option for, what, 20 something million dollars next year. I think it could go up to $27 million or $25 million based off of his performances over the last two seasons, which have been pretty spot on. But Stroman is probably going to not pick up his option for next season becoming a free agent wanting to hit the market again and if you're the cubs you got to make a decision are you going to invest your team in stroman going forward it would be a very wise investment to do so but if not there is not a team in baseball that could use a number one like the cincinnati reds and they're they're going to be in it to be a postseason team you know you got the brewers you got the pirates who got off to a good start have uh, understandably cooled off I don't think they're a bad baseball team. I think they're a 500 team or a little bit better. But I think when it's all said and done, I think they'll be on the outside looking in when it comes to the postseason this year. But the Brewers are in a very good position there. The Cubs, as they look at look are looking up at everybody else. You know, the season's not over for them, but it's getting close. And if you're the Cardinals, you really need a miracle to jump up there and and take that. National League Central, which they were expected to do coming into the season. Now, you hear the commissioner, Rob Manfred, he kind of doubles down on his thought that the fans of the Oakland Athletics are to blame for the team moving to Las Vegas. And is that an issue? Uh, You know, listen, I think I, I have on the record several times talking about the fans not being accountable enough. Is this really something you could throw at the fans? I think of the Oakland Athletics as a team that has always been difficult to draw in that in that area. Now, have they been up in the top of, of uh, um, attendance figures in Major League Baseball even at their best? Probably not. But they're a group of fans that get behind their team. Um, the owner may not be the best to own a Major League Baseball franchise. I don't think his intentions are great. Now, listen, he's getting a stadium in Las Vegas. Uh, There's going to be a lot more revenue going into the Las Vegas market than Oakland. So maybe it might be a better opportunity for the owner. But understand that the commissioner works for the owners. Rob Manfred's job is to stick up for the owner of the Oakland Athletics. So I'm not even going to throw his name out because I have so little respect for him and the way he's operated that franchise. Um, I I don't like the blame of Oakland and its fans in this spot. 
And like I said, this is coming from a person, John PL. You've heard me feel like, and I've made this statement, that fans are not accountable enough as it comes to the world of sports. They don't take any blame for everything. It's always somebody else's fault. It's never the fans. But when it comes to the A's moving to Las Vegas, it is not the fault of the Major League Baseball fan. Now, the NBA draft was just a couple days ago. The Portland Trailblazers were in a position where they were looking to maybe trade the number three overall pick to get Damian Lillard uh, a little bit of help. Maybe get him a supporting cast member. Uh, Brandon Ingram, maybe a Zion Williamson type. Uh, there were some discussions about possibilities with the Portland Trailblazers. They decided to hold on to the number three pick and take Scoot Henderson, who they claim is better than any player they could have traded for. What does that mean when it comes to Damian Lillard? I think there's a lot of popular media out there that's saying that Lillard's going to be that iconic type of player traded to a contender. How would the Knicks look with him? How would the Bulls look with him? How would, um, I don't know, 10 to 12 other NBA teams look with Damian Lillard alongside of the star that they have? While that's all true, I still have very little belief in the fact that the Portland Trailblazers are going to trade this player. I'm going to continue to put this on record. Now, it's going to be up to Damon in the end. If he wants out of Portland, if he doesn't feel like that city really does care or that organization cares about winning right now, he may ask for a trade. And if he asks for a trade, the Portland Trailblazers are going to honor that request. That being said, it, it, it's while it is up to Damian Lillard, I think there's just as much of a chance that he ends up staying in Portland and they try to put something together around Scoot Henderson and get themselves into contention this year. You look at the Sacramento Kings last year, you look at the Memphis Grizzlies two years ago, two younger teams that jumped to the forefront of what has been considered a very deep Western Conference in a short time frame. And if Scoot Henderson is anywhere near what is expected to be a really good player right away, then the Portland Trailblazers may be on their way. I had to talk about Chris Paul going to Golden State. A lot of it reeks of that veteran player going to that team that's expected to win with the results not being there. Chris Paul has not won an NBA championship. I don't think it's all on him. I think he should have been traded to the Lakers when a commissioner stepped in and kept that deal from going years ago. He's been on very good teams. He's been to the NBA Finals. I think it's a great opportunity for him to play with Steph Curry and Klay Thompson and maybe Draymond Green. But I, but I think it's going to be a little bit of Fagazi, Fagazi. You're going to get a little bit of tricked into believing that Chris Paul, the Hall of Fame player, which he is, is going to be the one that's going to show up on the court and help the Golden State Warriors. I think it's good to acquire the name, but sometimes you want to acquire the player's past in addition to what you have right now, and I don't think Chris Paul is it. As we jump into today's Saving Sports History segment here on the Past Ball Show, the only show out there that is saving the likes of sports history, going back to 1882, the National League expelled umpire Rich Higgum, and he was banned for life because he was found to be betting on games in Major League Baseball that he was officiating. So really the first scandal when you're talking about games maybe not being on a level or impacted by somebody on the field goes back to the day of 1882, and today is the 24th day of June 2023. So you're talking about 141 years ago, really the first evidence that somebody was kind of impacting a game in a way that he shouldn't have been. 1922, the American Football Association is renamed the National Football League, which it's known today on that same very day, the Chicago Staley's were renamed the Chicago Bears, what they're known as today, by legendary owner, president, and coach George Hallis. And George Hallis, whose coaching days goes to all the way through to the 60s, was actually the coach of the Bears in the 1920s, 1922. That's freaking insane. 1928, Bobby Jones, a well-known all-time golfer, wins in a 36-hole playoff, the U.S. Open. But what stands out, and 
you know, maybe, you know, it's, it's known in the lore of golf, his only major championship. And you're talking about a golfer that really is known as being one of the top players. Uh, you know, when you name the, the greatest and you name, you know, legend after legend as far as golfers, you've got to throw Bobby Jones' name in there. Only one major championship in his career. 1947, on this date, Jackie Robinson stole home for the first time in his Major League Baseball career. 1955, Harmon Killebrew, one of the top sluggers in the history of Major League Baseball. Somehow I eluded him out of my top 100. He's definitely in the top 110 as far as offensive position players to ever play. Hit his first Major League home run. 1968, Joe Frazier knocks out Manuel Ramos in a second round in his first title defense since becoming the heavyweight champion. 1979, Ricky Henderson stole his first base. You know, the 1,409 he has in a, one of the greatest, probably the most untouchable records in the history of sports. He had his first one on this day in 1979. 1983, Don Sutton recorded his 3,000th MLB strikeout. 1992, the Orlando Magic select Shaquille O'Neal with the number one overall pick in the NBA draft. 1998, the Los Angeles Clippers take Michael Olawakandi with the number one overall pick in the draft. That ends up not working out, obviously. Um, John Wall in 2010 is the number one overall pick by the Washington Wizards. And the, in 1995, the New Jersey Devils win their first Stanley Cup, four games to zero over the Detroit Red Wings. Anything else I got? 2010, John Isner beats Nicholas Mahout in 11 hours and three minutes over three days for the longest match in the history of professional tennis in, this happens to be in Wimbledon. 2013, the Chicago Blackhawks win their first Stanley Cup in a long time, their fifth championship, four games to two over the Boston Bruins. And birth dates on the 24th day of June, legendary boxer Jack Dempsey was born on this day in 1895. Shoe icon Chuck Taylor was born on this day in 1901. Uh, Three-time major golf champion, Billy Casper, was born on this day in 1931. Sam Jones, 10-time NBA champion with the Boston Celtics, was born on this day in 1933. Former Los Angeles Kings center Bernie Nichols, played for a handful of other teams, was born on this day in 1961. And, of course, iconic soccer star Lionel Messi was born on this day in 1987. This is the Past Ball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com, by St. Aloysius Church in Jackson, New Jersey, by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. If you're interested in hearing me flap my yacht mouth, you can check me out on YouTube, iTunes, uh, Spotify, Amazon Music, any way you catch your podcast. Hopefully we'll be back with you uh, pretty soon. This is the Past Ball Show. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side. Chris Bryant was on the Chicago Cubs roster opening day. I have many leather-bound books. My apartment smells of rich mahogany. Why don't you give it all for a majority of it to the team that wins the freaking World Series? I was going to listen to that, but then I just carried on it in my mind. I may come out as the biggest major league baseball manager apologist. That'll only make someone work just hard enough not to get fired. Because hitters are going out there saying, I'm either going to hit a home run or I'm going to strike out. And if I don't get a pitch that I feel like I could drive out of the park, I'm not even supposed to be here today. Especially prospect whores and hoarders are going to be a little pissed off at me when I say this. I'm a dude who lay in the dude disguised as another dude. There are only two managers in baseball's Hall of Fame who have losing records. One of them is the iconic Connie Mack, who you could say, in spite of winning five World Series championships as a manager, could be in as much as a pioneer. And what side of the spectrum they're on? Were they pitching? Were they batting? If your favorite team was pitching and a ball got inside and hit a batter, there's no way it could have been on purpose. But if, if you were a fan of the team that was batting and a ball got inside and hit somebody or went behind somebody's head, absolutely 100%, unequivocally, that pitcher was throwing at them. They put their tail between their legs and decided they're going to do exactly what they're told. You damn well right. Better give.
you have a contract extension. You damn well right. Better make him the manager over the next series of years. Thirty-five years ago, I could have loaned your parents the money for an abortion.